I'm here with Jim Sapika. He is the director of the National Firearms Museum here at NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. And Jim, thank you for being with us this week for the Curator's Corner. A very interesting revolver you have there. Tell us a little bit about it, if you would. Well, John, thanks for, for having us on again. This is a uh, Smith & Wesson new model number three. It's my all-time favorite handgun model. Um, it was introduced by Smith & Wesson in 1878 and produced up through the turn of the century. Of course, uh, uh, Colt more or less made the beginning of their company on the invention of the repeating firearm, the effective revolver. Similarly, Smith & Wesson's uh, uh, startup was founded on uh, making a, a handgun for the self-contained metallic cartridge, which of course was a huge advance from the uh, lead ball, loose powder, and primer system that had, had preceded it. Uh, their, their first gun uh, was a tiny little seven-shot revolver. Uh, being their first gun, first revolver they produced, they called it their model number one. It was introduced prior to the uh, Civil War and really the first uh, uh, popular American cartridge revolver. They followed it with a Model II, uh, which was a slightly larger revolver. Both of these were tip-up single-action spur trigger revolvers. Model II was a popular personal sidearm in the Civil War. In the post-Civil War era, gun, a very accurate gun. They began with what eventually became the American model. Uh, large contracts from the Russian government led to what came to be known as the Russian model. Uh, the American military wanted a version and uh, so it was introduced as the Schofield uh, in 1875. In 1878, Smith & Wesson discontinued production of the American, Russian, and Schofield models of their Model 3 and introduced what they called the new model number three. The model three refers to the, sa the frame size, just like we'd call a large Smith & Wesson revolver in the 44 Magnum class today, an end frame. Uh, with the top brakes, the model three was the, uh, uh, large, uh, the large platform for the Smith & Wesson. It's a uh, uh, elegant, beautifully balanced gun. Uh, the grip is uh, uh, ergonomically, it fits my hand, uh, as well or better than any handgun ever made. The uh, actual frame is very similar to the popular Smith & Wesson uh, K-frame grip today. I was going to say, it looks, when you pull it away from the, the front of it, it's different because the way it's designed sure. open. When sure. you pulled your hand away from the grip, it definitely has that Smith look to it's it. It's got that great feel to it, and yeah. uh, they had a good thing, and they continued it uh, with the hand ejectors, the swing-out revolvers. In 1899, they introduced the K-frame with a very similar grip configuration still being manufactured today. But uh, uh, this was introduced and uh, was the basis for their large frame production uh, from the late 1870s through the turn of the century. It is a top brake revolver, which means that you lift the barrel latch uh, to open it. It exposes the rear face of the cylinder and automatically ejects the uh, uh, cartridges in there if you continue the opening stroke. Uh, exposes the face for very fast re reloading. The uh, new model number three was a remarkably accurate gun. It uh, held many of the target records uh, throughout the late 19th century. Popular in the American West, you know, we think of the classic Colt single action army right. as, the, as the cowboy gun. Well, if you look at actual production figures, the Smith & Wesson Model 3 and its various configuration uh, outproduced the Colt single action in its configurations up through the early 20th century. Now many, many of the Smiths went to overseas contracts uh, for military use in Russia especially, but also Japan and a number of other companies, uh, countries. Uh, some used in the U.S. military as well, not, not as many, uh, probably the Schofield model was the most prolific there with about 8,000 used during the Indian Wars era. But uh, uh, the uh, large frame Colt production really didn't catch up with uh, Smith & Wesson until the uh, 
early 20th century. Tell us a little bit about that particular firearm. It's got some beautiful uh, detail work on it. This particular gun is a very, very unique configuration for this gun. Uh, one of the first things is the standard chambering for this revolver was 44 Russian. This is in the 38 U.S. service cartridge, a predecessor of the 38 Special, and uh, Smith & Wesson chambered only less than a handful of this model in that particular caliber. It has an unusual uh, target uh, combat sight. Uh, the standard sight was a fixed sight. They had a uh, adjustable target sight that was very popular with target shooters that was screw adjustable for windage and elevation. This combat target sight is drift adjustable so that it can be adjusted uh, uh, for the ammunition and the situation but isn't as fragile as the target sight. The engraving is the uh, classic Smith & Wesson style engraving. Gustav Jung was the master engraver for Smith & Wesson at this time and uh, his sons uh, were working with him as engravers and it's the very typical, very tight circular scroll engraving uh, from the Smith & Wesson uh, engraving shop at, uh, at the time. Beautiful hand checkered uh, wood grips. This gun uh, has a very special provenance to it. This, uh, the, the Smith & Wesson factory records show that this gun was shipped to Colonel Theodore Roosevelt. It was, uh, it was actually shipped in May of 1898 on the very day that Roosevelt left New York to go to San Antonio to train the Rough Riders. Of course, as you know, uh, Roosevelt had been involved in the administration as the Undersecretary of the Navy, uh, was uh, very much an advocate of going to war with Spain, and when war actually broke out, he, uh, he resigned his desk job and went uh, to actually raise the uh, uh, first volunteer cavalry, which became known as Roosevelt's Rough Riders, and uh, from the training in San Antonio, through Florida to actual combat in, uh, in, in Cuba. Uh, we believe this may have been a gun that Roosevelt planned to take with him, uh, specifically because of the unusual chambering. Um, it's, it, you can uh, speculate that he would have wanted the gun to be chambered for the U.S. service cartridge, which was the 38 Colt cartridge at the time. Now we know that when Roosevelt actually got to Cuba, his carry sidearm was a Colt double action revolver that had been salvaged off the sunken battleship Maine. So uh, uh, that is the one that he actually carried. But this remained in the uh, uh, Roosevelt family, we believe, throughout his lifetime. And it's a, a very special gun, very beautiful gun, and of course uh, uh, going to one of our uh, uh, most uh, uh, favorite presidents are shooting us president. That's right, an NRA president. Yeah, uh, not a, president of the NRA, but he was an NRA member. Of the NRA member. And, uh, now, uh, tell where can we find that here at the National Firearms Museum? It's very appropriately displayed in the Roosevelt Room, which is the Beretta Gallery. It's a beautiful recreation of uh, Theodore Roosevelt's study uh, from Sagamore Hill uh, with a number of wonderful guns from that period, including some exceptional high grade shotguns. Uh, and uh, a, a Colt single action army actually, uh, that actually served with the Rough Riders in, uh, in Cuba. So we have some great guns in that room. It's a great setting and just one of the many uh, galleries at the National Firearms Museum. Which you can see on the website, and we'll talk about that in the personal, with, with an, uh, I should say a virtual tour, but we like the personal touch about getting out if you're in the area. So tell us a little bit about how, how folks can come see treasures like this at the National Firearms Museum. Anytime folks get into the Washington, D.C. area, we're located right at NRA headquarters in Fairfax, Virginia. Uh, it's, a, it's an easy, easy shot in from the D.C. area uh, for folks who are coming out here and very worth uh, anyone's time. Uh, we're located on Waples Mill Drive. We're open uh, every day of the week from 9.30 to 5. On Saturdays, we're open late until 7 p.m. So if you, if you can get by Saturday, uh, uh, you can come by Saturday evening. Uh, closed only on major holidays, so we're open weekends and every day a week. And of course, admission is free, so uh, uh, we encourage folks to get out and see them in person. If you can't do that, uh, you can visit our website, the nationalfirearmsmuseum.org. We have a good virtual tour on there. And during the next year, we're going to be trying to get more and more of our collection actually up 
on the website. And we hope to eventually have a, a virtual museum there where you can go online and see the, uh, the, the special firearms treasures from the museum as well as the many, many uh, various makes and models of firearms that we do have on display here. Chief Sapika, thank you very much for a great installment and a beautiful firearm here this week on the Carrier's Corner. Thank you so much, John.